the 21st day of December 2022, of course, uh, only three days before Christmas. <laughs> so we are here, of course, being a Wednesday to talk about matters that deals with health. Um, majorly, the segment is called the Healthy, Wealthy Wise Edition. And so uh, for the next few uh, weeks, we'll be talking to experts from Topil Hospital. Uh, Topil Hospital is a brain and spine hospital. Uh, but then beyond that, they also provide other services. So with me today is um, a doctor. Uh, called Dr. Mwadime, who will help us uh, discuss um, common injuries and uh, their first aid. Of course, we may not be able to um, capture um, all of them today, but then I uh, will introduce three of them. That is bleeding, I will talk about poisoning and stroke um, and their first aids. And then um, we'll be able to also continue the topic once we resume after the Christmas break. But then before you get there, allow me to remind you that uh, we're coming live from Dawi Africa Photography. Uh, Dawi Africa Photography is situated in Zan Mall. Zan Mall is um, along the Eldoret Uganda Road, just opposite Barangay Twin. So anytime you need anything that goes into video and photo production, talk to uh, Dawi Africa Photography. So without much ado, allow me to uh, give a chance to Dr. Mwadime to introduce himself better, of course, and also say uh, a little bit about what they do at Topil Hospital. Uh, thank you, Kalia. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Nathaniel Mwadime. I'm a medical officer, resident at uh, Topil Hospital. So our facility is a brain and spine center. Uh, it deals with, uh, we specialize in brain and spine conditions. But on top of that, we also deal with all other medical conditions. So it's a fully fledged uh, hospital, level five, uh, top notch with uh, expert consultants and uh, expert medical services being provided there. So we welcome you uh, in case you have a relative, a friend, or you in case you need medical attention. You can find us there. Find us there. We are next to Boma Inn here in Eldoret at Elgon View. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Daktari. And thank you so much for also making time to be uh, on uh, the Morning Glory show. So, of course, uh, today I'll do the less talking because <laughs> Daktari is here, so he'll do more of the explanation and everything. So uh, I believe we'll start with bleeding. Um, basically, um, as the Swahili cliche goes, as ajali aina kinga. Lakini, um, daktari na juata sema komba uh, kifo kina kinga. That means that there's something you can do in case an incident happens and uh, somebody is bleeding. So, um, daktari will take us through what you need to know actually when somebody is bleeding. So, daktari, let's assume that an accident has happened and um, uh, there's somebody watching currently who um, is in that uh, particular scene and there's somebody bleeding. Maybe what are the, some of the steps they need to take? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. That's a very good question. So, uh, as my colleague Kali has said, uh, accidents do occur. It's something that maybe you might not be able to avoid at that particular and any situation. So, when you are involved in an accident or when you have witnessed an accident that has occurred that uh, leads to bleeding of some sort, uh, depending on the type of injury that has occurred, uh, for example, you have uh, bleeding from an from a limb, your limbs, either your legs or your hands. Someone has uh, got an, an accident, they have decapitated one of their, their limbs or their hands and they are bleeding profusely. So the first thing you, you can do before that patient uh, gets to a medical facility is you put a tourniquet. Your main purpose for that is just to arrest the bleeding. Because what will happen is that the more they continue bleeding, their life keeps on being in even much danger. So you want to arrest that bleeding as soon as possible. So even before the ambulances get there, before any medical practitioner gets there, what you need to do is you try and arrest that bleeding. So do you have a piece of cloth? Do you have a lasso around you? Tie it off completely. So for example, someone has had his leg cut off due to an accident. So what do you do? You just tie above there. The, the injured point. So just tie a tight knot above the injured point. What that does, it stops blood flow from going to the, to the lower extremity. So is it a leg? Is it an arm? Tie it off. Let's say, for example, someone has got a penetrating injury. Penetrating injury is whereby you, you've gotten an accident, then one of the shrapnel uh, penetrates your, your abdomen. At that point, what do you want to do as, a, as an individual next to the scene? 
uh, first and foremost, do not remove that, that object. What happens is when you remove that object, you might cause more damage coming out than, going, than what the object did going in. For example, the object can be going in and missed a vital organ, let's say the liver. But when you're pulling it out, <laughs> when you're pulling it out because you're not aware of it, you end up lacerating, I'm cutting through the liver. So the patient will die even before getting to the, to the hospital. So what you do in such a situation, you found out that there's a penetrating injury, a schnapple, an object has gotten into their abdomen or their chest. What you do, you apply pressure from the site bleeding around the, the object. So you can take a less so any clean cloth that is around you, just even if it's your shirt, just take it off, place it around the object, and apply pressure. If the person is conscious, is not conscious enough, you may zungusha that object As you wait for medic for uh, uh, emergency response to to get there. So any kind of bleeding, the the bottom line is try and uh, arrest the bleeding from that point. So. Use a cloth, use a lasso, anything that you can have to actually cover the point that is actually bleeding. So when you do that, you are actually helping that patient because they're not losing blood. Yes, and you can, as you know, ox, blood is an, that's where our oxygen carrying capacity is. So when someone is losing blood, they're also losing uh, the oxygen carrying capacity. So that actually makes them, uh, their prognosis and mortality is actually very high for such patients. Yes. common mistakes that many people uh, do make when uh, bringing on those bleeding in relation to bleeding and all that. Oh, so some of the mistakes some, uh, someone do, as I mentioned earlier, is removing the source of the injury. For example, when someone has a penetrating injury, a stab wound to the abdomen, a stab wound to the chest, to the neck. What, uh, the, some of the common mistakes that people do is they actually pull it out. They think, this is the source of the, the injury, let me take it up. So when you, when you do that, it's actually doing much harm to that patient. Because in other situations, when the object went in, it threw to a, through an artery or a vein, but also caused a, it actually stopped the bleeding from that point. So it bled, then it it, it put a hold on it. So it's basically like it covered the artery, so it's not bleeding anymore. When you pull it out, you start seeing blood spurting out of that, that position. You don't have time from there. So some of the common mistakes is like someone pulling out an, an object. Another common mistake that I see people do is when you have witnessed an accident, uh, uh, some people usually try and uh, I, it's good to try and save as many people as possible when you're pulling out. The, 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 the individuals, the victims that have been involved in that accident. So what I really like to educate people on is when you are trying to do that, uh, be extra careful to such individuals. Most of for areas like the neck and uh, the head, depending on how that posi the person has been uh, positioned during that accident, be extra careful when you are taking them out. Uh, be observant on the, of the things that are around that. Uh, that individual to try and actually when you're pulling them out so that you can pull them out gently as you you evacuate that the person. the person from the position when you pull them out gently in case there's any fracture that they have occurred let's say a fracture to the neck you when you pull them gently by holding their their neck and positioning their head you do not displace that injury from where it has been and where it has occurred so that gentle movement is usually very very important. Try and do it with someone else who is next to you. Usually two people is easier doing it than, than one person. Because when you're pulling out as one person, you may end up causing more damage to, the, to that individual. You cannot be able to help him as your own. Call for help. Always call for help. Okay. Yes, there's, there's always time. Just shout. So that the person next to you can actually, they come to the scene. Call for help. Help yourselves to be able to to remove that individual, yeah. Okay, mm. well, thank you so much, Dr. Of course, Dr. they are saying there is always time enough for you mm. to call for help. Mm. Also, I'm uh, trying to say that uh, make sure that uh, you do not actually remove the object. Uh, if it is pierced, uh, there is some way to wear the, 
the object is the spears and it's already in, uh, avoid just pulling it out. Of course, if you're already on the broadcast, tell me where you tuned in from. Of course, I can see some people already coming in. Kids like me saying good morning, good morning to you. There's a Hillary Bell saying good morning, good morning to you. Mildred let Sumi Pondani, you Pondani, Pia. So I'll keep on reading uh, more and more of these comments, but then uh, as we also continue, make sure that you tag in as many friends as possible. Today with us is Dr. Mwadime from um, Topi Hospital. Topi, Topi Hospital is um, a brain and spine facility, but then uh, beyond that also they provide other services. So majorly they do brain and spine, but then also uh, in addition to that they provide all the other services that a level 5 hospital should be uh, providing. So make sure that anytime uh, you have a sister, a brother, or somebody you know who needs uh, medical attention, you refer them to Topi Hospital. So find the best brain and spine hospital in the region. In the meantime, tag in as many friends as possible so that we are also able to benefit from this knowledge being uh, disseminated on the, on the show uh, this morning. So make sure that you talk to us and let's um, engage and talk to each other. And uh, Dr. Um, another thing that uh, so many people ask is that, um, of course, not so many people, uh, uh, <laughs> too many people, uh, blood is not their cup of tea. And yeah. When we talk about bleeding, of course, we are talking about uh, blood. I think, I don't know, uh, am I okay now? Okay. <laughs> I think they are losing me on the mic, but then I think we're okay now, right? Okay, so um, what I was saying is tag in as many friends as possible. Make sure that uh, they enjoy the broadcast. I also told you that Topi right now is the best pri brain and spine facility within this region. Uh, situated in Eldoret, Elgon View, just next to Bomain, you'll be able to see a Topi Hospital. So anytime you have somebody who uh, requires medical attention, remember to take them to a Topi Hospital. Now, a doctor was telling you that to many people, uh, they many people fear blood. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody will say that blood is not my cup of tea. Yes. And when you speak, talking about bleeding here, um, maybe what are some of these things that are also while helping somebody who's been involved in an incident, I need to be aware of in terms of protecting myself. So, uh, when someone is involved in an accident, uh, Basically, we do not know the medical condition of that patient, <laughs> their past history, what they have been on, and things like that. So safety becomes a very uh, important thing. And I believe it's usually very hard to access gloves when you're in an accident situation because it's an emergency and it's just happened. So not very many people walk around with, with gloves. gloves yeah. yeah. So what we can actually do when you're trying to assist such a patient, try as much as possible not to directly uh, get into contact with their, with their blood. For example, what am I saying? Someone has gotten injured to the limb, uh -huh. the hand, and they are bleeding. Uh -huh. uh, let's say one of the hands has been cut off and they are, uh -huh. due to the accident, they are bleeding so much. Uh -huh. What do you want to do? Uh, I said earlier that you need to tie a tourniquet around the, uh -huh. above the, the injured side. Uh -huh. So when you're trying to tie that tourniquet above the injured side, you don't need to touch the, the bleeding the ble side uh -huh. actively. Uh -huh. So you just need to get something, a cloth you have on. Is it a shirt that you have on? Uh -huh. you remove it. Uh, wrap, uh, tear it apart, wrap it around the, the limb. So by doing that, you're actually avoiding the active side that is bleeding, and at the same time, you're helping stop the, the bleeding. bleeding. <laughs> same to someone has a stab wound to the mm -hmm. abdomen, to the chest. Mm -hmm. It's bleeding on top. So mm -hmm. instead of pulling out the object, what you're doing, you're taking a cloth around it, you're wrapping it around. So by wrapping it around, you usually take care not to touch the area that is actually bleeding. So mm -hmm. when you wrap it around, mm -hmm. Now, you've wrapped it enough so that you don't see blood coming out of the shirt. Then mm -hmm. you, you tell the patient, if the patient is conscious enough to, to hold it for mm -hmm. themselves. If they're not, you can actually hold it. And by doing that, mm -hmm. you're not actually coming to direct contact with the, with the blood. With the blood. Mm -hmm. So your safety is also assured. Mm -hmm. So my, my point being, don't be afraid to help them. Mm -hmm. You are saving a life by doing that. Mm -hmm. But also take care of yourself when, you, when you're doing that. So by doing some of those simple measures, avoiding direct contact with your blood, you actually safe. Mm -hmm. And just in case you have a, a cut of your own, mm -hmm. for example, you are also in that accident, but you've had minor injuries and you have cuts of your, mm -hmm. of your own. Mm -hmm. And you're really worried that you have come into contact with someone's blood and mm -hmm. you don't know. I know most people are worried about people's status and uh, infections and things like that. Mm -hmm. When you come to a, a, a medical facility, we do have protective medicines that can be given. For example, if you're worried about someone's uh, HIV status, the medicine has really advanced. We have things like 
pre uh, post exposure prophylaxis it's medication that we can give to those people who have been exposed to injuries or situations that involve mixing of blood and you you are so you are categorized as a high risk individual mm-hmm. so you are given medications the government gives them out for free uh, so that you can be able to take that medication and you'll be you'll be you'll safe be okay. you'll mm-hmm. be okay mm-hmm. so don't be afraid to help someone mm-hmm. take care of yourself as you're doing that mm-hmm. to avoid direct contact with with blood in case you have that direct contact with blood you when you get uh, to the medical facility just disclose we are going to to help Yes. Okay. Mm. Uh okay, thank you so much for that. Uh we continue to talk to Dr. Mwadim uh, from Topil Hospital of course talking about bleeding. Uh there are those who just tuned in and asking uh, actually what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about uh, first aid for common injuries and uh, we're talking um assuming that uh, maybe there is an incident or an accident that has occurred and uh, there is somebody who is injured and they are actively bleeding and so we're trying to look at uh, some of the first aid that you may need uh, to or some of the things that you may need to know when uh, actually um administering first aid to that particular person um as we go on I'll also be sampling some of uh, your comments of course I can see already uh, we have uh, somebody called uh, um Eldoret FC okay so that, that is not somebody <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll say a group of people called Eldoret FC are saying they are tuned in. So thank you so much also for making time to be with us. Um, Daksari, most of the time also in an accident situation, you've talked about somebody being conscious enough and maybe now unconscious. Mm-hmm. So um, what does, when somebody is conscious, how different is it when you are handling somebody who is bleeding when they are conscious and when they are unconscious? Maybe what are some of the differences and the points that you need to note when assisting such a person? So uh, not uh, on a first aid point of basis at the site at the scene not much different really entails it because your primary objective is to actually stop the, the bleeding, the bleeding. Mm-hmm. so the difference comes in when someone is conscious is now mm-hmm. conscious enough you mm-hmm. want to make sure that they don't get to the unconscious mm-hmm. point mm-hmm. so as i earlier said uh, mm-hmm. uh, when you are bleeding actively mm-hmm. you're losing oxygen carrying capacity mm-hmm. in your blood and loss of blood in itself already makes you being in in grave danger mm-hmm. so when you arrest that bleeding at that particular point in sight mm-hmm. you're actually helping this patient not this victim not lose their their Blood. consciousness mm-hmm. so uh, this is a patient you want to make sure that, that they don't slip down to the unconscious state by unconscious state what do i mean is this patient this person active so for example uh, an accident has occurred that uh, a, a road traffic accident has just occurred so an unconscious patient you when when you're trying to wake them up they are not awake mm-hmm. they they are, they basically not they are just asleep there that's an unconscious patient mm-hmm. a conscious patient yule mwenye anaweza sema nisaidieni as they can actually talk mm-hmm. they are actually aware of what is going around them mm-hmm. but also this patient is easily sleeping into the unconscious state more mm-hmm. so if they are actively mm-hmm. bleeding so when you can actually see the bleeding arrest it for an unconscious patient the quiet one the uh, the quiet patient it they, you can easily lose that patient mm-hmm. at that point inside mm-hmm. what because they cannot shout for help that's mm-hmm. that's one thing they cannot do mm-hmm. secondly you can actually easily forget that this patient was this victim is actually in the in the in the ax in the car let's mm-hmm. say it's a it's a matatu or a bus mm-hmm. that has many individuals being involved in an accident so you as a bystander will not know how many passengers were why inside, were there, yeah. why inside. Mm-hmm. so an unconscious patient you might actually uh, not see them mm-hmm. at that particular point in, mm-hmm. in time mm-hmm. so when you uh you rushing in to actually help uh, such individuals <laughs> and the conscious patient is around you you've tied off the the bleeder they are actually awake some of them will tell you i i had a friend mm-hmm. at the back seat mm-hmm. go check on them rush to them also <laughs> because these patients when they are bleeding the procedure is still the same tie off the the, the point try uh, try and stop that point that is actually bleeding mm-hmm. and you as the uh, emergency person okay, uh, you as the first person on the scene <laughs> not necessarily the uh, the emergency service provider mm-hmm. can actually help the people who are coming in for uh, emergency service so let's mm-hmm. say an ambulance comes in mm-hmm. you can actually tell them oh there's an unconscious patient that is actually there so mm-hmm. by giving that information those people are trained enough they will know that that is a, is a very serious patient so as they continue helping this one mm-hmm. they'll also give priority to the patient who is unconscious who's because unconscious. so many things have also happened when a patient is unconscious meaning there's head injury that is being involved mm-hmm. so action needs to be taken very fast mm-hmm. so as they get ferried out to 
to a nearby medical center, they usually give priority to that patient who is unconscious mm -hmm. in the, on, that, on the scene so that they get ferried fast. That does not mean that this other patient who is conscious will not get ferried <laughs> fast <laughs> enough. No, they will. Because uh, in, our, in our center, thank God, in Eldoret, you have very medical, very many medical centers. So mm -hmm. access to ambulances is usually very high. So when an accident scene has occurred, mm -hmm. trust me, there will be as many ambulances as there are yeah. that, at that particular point in time. So your work actually is to make sure that uh, is there bleeding going on? for any of the patients, unconscious, unconscious. Can you be able to stop it before the emergency medical services arrive? And when they arrive, please tell them. Because uh, tell them there's a, there's a victim there, there's a victim there, there's this victim who is shouting there, there's one that is sleeping at the, at the, at the, at the other corner there. I've tried to wake them up, but they're not waking up. Yes. <laughs> Okay, of course, I, I know we've majorly dwelt on uh, accident. At times, also fights do occur and all that, yeah. but I believe the procedures are almost <laughs> all the same. <laughs> if bleeding is just bleeding, mm -hmm. it's just that we're just trying to look at uh, uh, the, the most uh, common that we'll get. Of course, if it's fighting, of course, <laughs> so thank you so much for that. <laughs> Yes. So um, I, I think as we, we're almost wrapping up on bleeding because uh, t today we're talking about three um, three emergencies. Uh, we've uh, mentioned that bleeding. Uh, we'll also talk about stroke and also talk about poisoning. But then uh, as we wrap up on uh, bleeding, um, we've not maybe said something about bleeding on the nose. I can see somebody uh, telling me uh, t t to ask you that uh, what happens if the person is bleeding from the nose. So I think uh, that is the only thing that we've not handled there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for that question. So when someone is bleeding from the nose, usually your, your purpose is to actually try and make sure that the bleeding does not continue. So gravity plays a, a big role. So when someone is bleeding, the first aid thing that you actually do is just hold the nose and place them up, let them breathe through the, the, the mouth, mouth. Uh -huh. then rush to a, to nearby. a, a nearby facility. Uh -huh. So by pinching, because most of the bleeding from the nose occurs from the region just uh, in, in above the nose uh -huh. before you get to the, the bony surface uh -huh. of the nose. So by holding it tight like this, uh -huh. you're helping that patient by actually occluding the, uh -huh. the bleeder. I think next time that came to open you, Yes, but also of note is uh, there's, a, there's a, some of the situations you see when you're in a medical facility, uh -huh. There's uh, uh, farming accidents that do occur mm -hmm. that actually cause bleeding. So someone is actually farming or uh, cutting their fences, majipata, mm majikata, -hmm. na shoka, panga. And then necessarily, uh, it's not very deep to the point that it can be able to cut off the hand, but it has placed a, a big scar that is actually actively bleeding. Mm -hmm. What I found that is most individuals try to put other substances inside to try and stop the bleeding. Uh, You've yeah, seen yeah. situations where leaves people put that. tea leaves, <laughs> people put soil. Mm -hmm. uh, you are trying to, to, to put something else to try and stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I know it's common practice outside there, but it's very wrong. It's actually very wrong. The, the, the thing is, when you're trying to put up these other uh, things into the, into the wound, you're introducing infection to the wound. Now it becomes very hard to actually heal those wounds. Mm -hmm. the, the end point for, for, for such a, a cut, if it's a deep cut, is to try and suture that wound. And suturing is done at a, at a medical facility. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to do? Are you, if you're the individual involved in such a, a, a minor, minor accident, you want to wash off your wound with running water. Just running water. Mm -hmm. Get a, a tap with running water, wash off the wound, then tie with a clean cloth. Be it a handkerchief. A shirt, just tie it around to actually stop the wind and come to hospital. Mm -hmm. Don't put soil or <laughs> tea leaves inside. You actually when you're growing up, uh, there's this you plant. You're actually uh, causing more harm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There's a plant that uh, leaves a blackjack. And then there's also salt. I don't know if that was. <laughs> So you start bleeding, bio, bio. How wrong is that? <laughs> Usually, when you put such uh, external contaminants, we call them external contaminants, because mm -hmm. you, they, they are not sterile enough. Mm -hmm. So when you cut yourself mm -hmm. with a panga, there is infection introduced by the panga itself. Mm -hmm. You see? So that's why we say go wash it off fast enough. Mm -hmm. When you wash it out, remember when you've cut yourself, it was faster sterile 
Uh, it was a, a clean area. Mm -hmm. So when you wash it out, you're trying to make it as clean as possible. Then mm -hmm. you tie with a, a clean, clean cloth mm -hmm. to stop the bleeding. Your mm -hmm. purpose there is to actually stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Then rush to a, a nearby facility. Mm -hmm. They will clean and then they will suture. Mm -hmm. when, they, when they do the suturing, they have actually arrested the bleeding and corrected your, your deformity. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to put uh, any additives <laughs> inside completely. <laughs> So just wash it with the running water, uh -huh. tie with a clean coat, uh -huh. go to a medical facility. Uh -huh. That's usually the best thing you can do. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. But, mm -hmm. I also remember when you were growing up, uh, the one that you insert the, 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 the you, you insert your hand and by mistake, you insert your hand and by mistake, you insert your hand and And uh, people were discussing whether to carry the fingers along or to leave it behind. Of course, I know this looks like it's extreme, but then these are things that happen day in day out, especially uh, that we are a farming community. These are things that uh, will often happen. Of course, nowadays, uh, the machines have been improved in such a way that maybe your fingers may not slip in, yeah. but bado kuna watu wako old school. Maybe uh, at times you find that a whole organ actually, I don't know, is a finger an organ? Yes, yes. Yeah, so how long can his just it was have it to take because I would say a spare part of it. Anyway, sir, how long can is out? How how do you handle is, do you carry it along or what do you do? Yes. And if you are to carry it, how do you carry it? Uh, ideally in a in a in a bottle of ice. <laughs> but it's very hard to come along such things, you see, uh -huh. because you're in the in the farming setting. So what do you want to do? You want to ask when you've tied off the the bleeding part, mm -hmm. carry the, the, the finger, be, mm -hmm. even in a cloth, mm -hmm. rush it to them to, to a medical facility, Le, uh, specialized medical facilities. Uh, you can actually have refixation mm -hmm. back. And uh, it's, it's a complex activity that involves vascular surgeons and neurosurgeons and uh, surgeons uh, generally to try and uh, reattach you, your lip. But that can happen. Actually, so, I know of someone yeah. who lost their hand and it was, it was it gotten back. Yes, so uh, that can happen. Mm -hmm. So don't leave it on the side. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't leave it on the side. Yeah, you can actually be helped. So, it's been chopped off. It's still complete. Tie off so that you don't continue bleeding. Carry it to the, head, the to a medical facility fast enough. You can be helped. In, a, in level five, level six hospitals, uh, we have consultants that are, can actually help you in doing that. We mm -hmm. have an array of consultants, in, mm -hmm. uh, even at Topil Hospital, mm -hmm. that can actually help you to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Because you just need a team of vascular surgeons, you mm -hmm. need a team of neurosurgeons to attach the neurons back in place, mm -hmm. you have orthopedic surgeons to attach the tendons back in place. Mm -hmm. And when all that happens, you can get your limb back. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the person I'll quote on news, I, I, I got a chance to interview them. They actually, mm -hmm. they have ever carried their own hand. So, yeah, like I'm corona, I be able to get help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think uh, we've captured most of uh, um, information about uh, bleeding, unless there are more questions, uh, but I don't see more questions about bleeding. So, um, the next aspect that we're going to look at is um, poisoning. And um, being a farming uh, uh, region, of course, most of it will be from uh, farm inputs and all that. So, uh, Dr. Charlie will also take us through um, what to do in case somebody, one, as, as maybe start with as ingested um, uh, something that is poisonous. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, being this is a farming community, mm -hmm. we are exposed to herbicides, insecticides, pesticides. These are what we call organophosphate poisoning. Mm -hmm. uh, what they do, they interfere with, this kind of poisoning interferes with your breathing, mm -hmm. it increases your salivation, it increases your uh, urination. If people have diarrhea, other people have vomiting, other people have increased tears production, you have uh, symptoms like respiratory distress whereby difficulty mm -hmm. in breathing that actually occurs. So exposure to these chemicals has become, uh, it's very hazardous and it's actually deadly mm -hmm. when uh, uh, poisoned in uh, large quantities. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you need to do, let's say someone has ingested their, their poison, uh, can you induce a vomit? Usually not very advisable. If you're on the first aid scene, you want to rush them to a hospital because when you're inducing a vomiting, you, there's an aspect of aspiration whereby that vomit gets to your lungs and causes more damage. So you as the individual that is there, that has actually uh, witnessed a, a situation, mm -hmm. someone has mistakenly drunk poison, beat a mistake or maybe they were committing suicide mm -hmm. because some of the cases can occur because someone is committing suicide. suicide. <laughs> what you need to do is uh, decontaminate the, the patient. These poisons can uh, actually seep through our, our skin because of their nature. Mm -hmm. 
on how they are they are lipophilic in nature so they can actually slip through the the fat tissue in the in the skin and also increase poisoning so you want to decontaminate remove all their clothing completely discard those clothing away and when you're removing their clothing if you have any protective wear around you you can wear gloves even easy gloves kubwa za kufanyia za shamba yeah <laughs> just wear them and try remove them all the clothing that they have and then rush to the, rush to the to nini to a, a medical facility that is nearby you because time is of essence for this for this uh, kind of individuals and this kind of victims because when you rush them to a to a health facility they will be able to give antidotes and uh, fast aid medications to actually help uh, these patients not go into into things like coma or severe distress from from breathing so you as the as the uh, individual next to them your first instance is time time here is of really high essence do not delay with this patient <laughs> don't sit around and find out bona likunywa no just get them to a to a medical facility so you, what you want to do is decontaminate remove all their clothing <laughs> that they are actually wearing during <laughs> that during that uh, incidents that they are having remove them and discard you just throw them away completely mm -hmm. yeah because of the nature of this uh, chemicals. chemicals that mm -hmm. how they are for people who have been ingested even for people who have been inhaled mm -hmm. this this uh, kind of chemicals you want to rush them to to the facility mm -hmm. another thing you can actually do is wash wash their hands with soap and water mm -hmm. uh, i think back in chemistry soap was a very good uh, Uh, lipophilic agent that can mm -hmm. actually break down most of these chemicals so using soap and water by just washing their hands mm -hmm. washing their face if they have exposed to it's been exposed to their face and their eyes you wash them with soap and water uh, very fast then you rush to mm -hmm. to a the medical uh, to a hospital yeah mm -hmm. uh, uh, the reason why i discourage inducing vomiting is mm -hmm. because of that you can try and induce them to actually vomit the contents that they have and in subsequently they aspirate the the contents mm -hmm. so instead of it go going out through the mouth some of it will go out through the mouth others will go to the lungs and the then the damage becomes even more severe mm -hmm. so i usually discourage most of my uh, uh, patients that i see or relatives mm -hmm. that i see that have come with the uh, patients with poisoning mm -hmm. from actually inducing vomiting at at home mm -hmm. there's a safe way that can be done in a in, in a, a in a hospital mm -hmm. with trained individuals yeah Mm -hmm. And of course the same question will come back just like bleeding what are some of these common mistakes that people make then uh, when dealing with somebody who's ingested uh, poison yeah. well, one mm -hmm. of the mistake is uh, the first one is inducing vomit mm -hmm. from uh, someone who is not trained enough and experienced to actually mm -hmm. to actually do it when you do that the risk is as, as I've uh, said earlier mm -hmm. aspiration mm -hmm. of this context of the of the fact the other common mistake that people do I've seen is they carry the the individual bega kwa bega mtu namuona if it's a young child maybe mistakenly amekunywa hiyo a young boy mistakenly amekunywa hiyo poison they carry them with all the clothes that they actually want so if let's say for example a child uh, a young child amekunywa by mistake because she had placed it in a wrong environment people carry them with the clothes that they have so during that journey remember this poison can also slip through the skin. their skin you as the person who is carrying can also get the same uh, inhale, poisoning yeah, yeah inhale the same the poison. same poison mm -hmm. so that's the some of the mistakes that i see so when you get to a healthcare facility mm -hmm. you both are patients mm -hmm. both of you become patients become, become patients mm -hmm. because of exposure mm -hmm. so that those are the common mistakes that actually people do so mm -hmm. that's why it's very good to decontaminate mm -hmm. if it's your child that has mistakenly uh, ingested or played with this poison hata kama hajakunywa you Uh, acted promptly enough for me mona oh ameshika ile chupa ya ya pesticide before even hata ikunywe you rush to nombe mpokonya kwa mkono but remember ame amejimwagia nana he has poured himself that poison remove his clothing wash his wash his hands with soap water wash your hands with soap water cover them with something clean rush to hospital yes okay i can see somebody here called uh, Cal okay now So at times when i say somebody maybe mko wengi you say in kaltio nasaris that means it's a company saying what uh, and i'm sure they are more interested because of the handle chemicals mm -hmm. because they plant uh, trees saying what is the immediate process when someone in health poisonous farm chemicals so for them it's basically and uh, they they're more interested with inhalation mm -hmm. so how do you even know that uh, maybe what i've in health is has started affecting me uh, usually the uh, earlier said time is of essence <laughs> 
So for such a situation whereby the it's a nursery, so they deal with the chemicals, mm -hmm. uh, maybe herbicides or insecticides. Mm -hmm. Those most of them actually, uh, ninety percent of them are poisonous mm -hmm. when exposed to to humans. Mm -hmm. So no matter how little you think someone has in health, mm -hmm. expose them to to fresh air as you rush them to hospital. To hospital. Mm -hmm. Oxygenation becomes very important for, mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So expose them to fresh air. Mm -hmm. If they're wearing any tight clothes that can actually uh, tighten their chest, mm -hmm. remove the clothing completely. Mm -hmm. Aerosol aerosol uh, uh, insecticides, usually when they're exposed to it, it's not just in the inhalation part, there's the exposure to the, to the eyes. Mm -hmm. So you can start seeing someone tearing up. Wash them, wash their face completely wash their hands completely, discard the clothes because also the clothes have been have been contaminated. Mm -hmm. Then rush them to a health facility. You do not want to wait for this patient to start getting delirious. Mm -hmm. Delirious means an answer ku you don't want them to get there. Or you don't want this uh, your friend or your colleague mm -hmm. to actually have Symptoms like excessive salivation, mm -hmm. excessive mucus production, mm -hmm. uh, wheezing sounds when they are trying to breathe, difficulty mm -hmm. in breathing, uh, delirious, ama, altered mental status. When, when you're getting to that point, it's it's pretty serious. Meaning the poison has really taken effect in your in your body. You want them, to, you want to get them to a health facility when they are fresh and as uh, conscious as possible. Mm -hmm. They actually they can actually express themselves. That's the point you want to get them there. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, as Ayala said, time is the essence. Mm -hmm. When you are suspect that your friend has been exposed, am you yourself working in that environment? You have suspected that you have exposed yourself mm -hmm. to the contaminants. Mm -hmm. Just do that. Clean your face with soapy water. Uh, clean your hands with soapy water. Remove your clothes. Come to a healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just okay. tell your supervisor, I've exposed myself to these aerosols. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, most of these um, companies or nurseries do have mm -hmm. protective Mm -hmm. gadgets. Mm -hmm. You have masks, mm -hmm. respiratory masks, mm -hmm. you have goggles for your eyes, you have gloves for your hands, you have overalls that you actually use only in, in work. Mm -hmm. So when all that is happening, there is minimal exposure to the, to the plants you actually, mm -hmm. you actually spraying, mm -hmm. which is a very good thing. But just in case you have been exposed mistakenly, ex uh, decontaminate yourself, clean yourself with soapy water, rush to a facility. Don't wait to the point that you're getting some of these symptoms. Salivation, mm -hmm. uh, excessive tearing, excessive running nose, difficulty mm -hmm. in breathing, you're having diarrhea, you're having uh, altered mental status. By the time you're getting to that point, is usually a very serious mm -hmm. uh, point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, I think uh, some of you have answered this question in that uh, most of the time uh, when people attack poison, uh, not most of the time, let's say some of the time, mm -hmm. uh, when people attack poison, they're actually trying to commit suicide, which means that they may tend to hide, uh, yes. uh, trying to n not let anyone um, no. know that they have done what they've done. So you, uh, maybe, uh, are there any other signs apart from maybe salivating and uh, maybe a more mucus production and all that? What are some of the, these other signs that we can be able to observe and say there's somebody wrong with someone? Oh, so, uh, some of the common signs of uh, organophosphate poisoning, mm -hmm. to be specific, uh, is uh, salivation. You have hyper salivation. Mm -hmm. You have lacrimation. Lacrimation is just excessive production of, of tears. Mm -hmm. You have increased urination. Mm -hmm. You have increased urination. You have diarrhea. You have emesis. Emesis is excessive uh, vomiting in these mm -hmm. patients. Then you have those more serious uh, situations whereby you have difficulty in breathing. So someone has a wheezing sound when they try to, to breathe. You have a altered mental status. Altered mental status means things like you start developing delirium, uh, confusion. Mm -hmm. Then when it gets to a more severe point, you get to coma. Mm -hmm. So coma being now the, the, the most severe of all, apart from the respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. To that point, when you're getting to coma, when you get to a medical facility, those are the patients that you actually start to put on ventilatory support. Mm -hmm. Reversing that situation is usually very difficult mm -hmm. for these patients. Most of them do not survive mm -hmm. because of the extent at which the, the poisoning has taken effect in their, mm -hmm. in their body. Mm -hmm. So the initial signs, salivation, mm -hmm. lacrimation, mm -hmm. uh, diarrhea, vomiting. Mm -hmm. If you see, if you, someone has uh, try to to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. If someone has tried to commit suicide, you suspect that they have tried to commit suicide using uh, these phosphate poisons. 
the initial signs you'll see is just excessive tears, excessive revelation, mucus from their mouth, they are diarrhea, they are vomiting, <laughs> and you suspect, hey, I think my, I think this individual is so no. mm-hmm. rush them. Okay, what are you going to say? Dawa, sorry. Dawa. <laughs> uh, I think this individual is going to rush them to hospital. Mm-hmm. They might not want to come to hospital because they're actually trying to commit suicide. Just say Very hard to actually uh, get to see these patients because of the the clock and duck mechanisms that they employ trying to see that may, nobody actually that's realizes it. that they are committing suicide. <laughs> but in case you lack enough to actually see them uh, in the act, you can be able to act very fast. Or if you see them just after the act and you suspect that they have actually committed suicide, rush them to a facility. So the the safety measure for you as a first aid still remains the same. Remove all their clothing. Uh, make sure that you have something protecting your, your hands. If you don't have anything protecting your hands as you remove your clothing, the moment you've completely removed your clothing, wash, wash your with soap and water. Uh-huh. Then rush to a, a facility. Hospital. Just wrap them with something clean, rush to a hospital. To a hospital okay. To really help them. If, you, if the bottle that they have actually drunk is next to them, put them in a plastic, uh, polythene, plastic uh, bag, carry it to hospital. Us identifying that poison is usually very important for, so for mm-hmm. us to actually know what to to give as we continue giving the initial first aids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I think uh, we also, uh, I think conclusively talked about um, uh, the issue of poisoning. Unless I just uh, go through the comments and see some of the things that people are saying. Uh, of course, somebody is taking us back to bleeding. I think we'll be able to handle that. I think still it remains the same. <laughs> It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very important when kama mtu ameumwa na tuseme mbwa uh-huh. uh, but this one looks like him too <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah kama yeah i know okay <laughs> people are, are really carnivorous so so kama ameumwa na mbwa ama mnyama ama mtu ameumwa na anaanza ku bleed uh, wash it out with running water uh-huh. then tie it around come to hospital <laughs> doesn't matter the chunk yenye imetoka wewe kuja tu si okay i have but initially at that point just wash with running water it's very important because running water tries to decontaminate the in the initial stages because it's very good so it's clean and it uh, decontaminates at the initial stage so if there's any impurities any is it bit grass or stones or there's a even a piece of tooth <laughs> that is there <laughs> when you so wash the, it as a back up. <laughs> so when you rush with, when you wash with the running water then you tie with a clean cloth it, the the washing tries, helps to decontaminate uh-huh. the tying helps to control Stop the bleeding, bleeding. Uh-huh. So when then you rush to the hospital. To the hospital yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sure this is uh, maybe a little bit uh, on the side, but then uh, somebody is asking, I always bleed when it's too cold or hot three times a week. I don't know, you'll be able to handle that. Let me also look for another question. Um, somebody is asking about food poisoning. I don't know if you'll be able to also maybe say something about that. food poisoning. I think uh, Dr. will be able to talk about that. Um, this is still about inhalation of uh, farm inputs. I think that one you've handled. Uh, any other question? I think those are... Yeah, so there's somebody asking about uh, them bleeding from the nose uh, when it's too cold or too hot. And then there's somebody asking about food poisoning. I think so those bleeding are from the nose too cold or too hot, exposure to extreme temperatures, mm-hmm. a lot of coldness or a lot of heat. Mm-hmm. You have very small uh, blood vessels on you, mm-hmm. on top of you, nose mm-hmm. and at the, at the bridge on the, on the sides. Mm-hmm. That uh, blood vessels do respond to, to temperature changes. They contract or uh, expand us, mm-hmm. with lack of a better word, mm-hmm. on exposure to, to mm-hmm. temperature. Mm-hmm. So that's why this individual is really... Uh, having nose bleeds with extreme temperature changes. Mm-hmm. So the best uh, advice I can give to this individual, mm-hmm. you can uh, come to a facility. We have ENT surgeons if you're around the Doret, or you can go to any other facility mm-hmm. that contains ENT surgeons. They have coagulation procedures that can be done mm-hmm. to try and uh, uh, cauterize those small vessels so that you don't keep on bleeding every, every time. Mm-hmm. But if you're actively bleeding at that particular point in time, mm-hmm. just hold your nose and uh, mm-hmm. get to a Healthcare facility. Just try and hold your nose to actually stop the the initial bleeding. Then rush to a to a facility to actually help you with that. So for the individuals that were talking about food poisoning, so food poisoning does not necessarily come from uh, organophosphate, than the ones that I was talking about. It's very rare that you find someone who is poisoned using organophosphate from from food. food. 
but uh, most of the times food poisoning is because of uh, bact uh, bacterial or uh, amoebiasis infection to the to the food. Mm -hmm. So the food has gone stale, mm -hmm. so it's gotten uh, infected with uh, common bacteria, common oral bacteria, food, and they are called fecal oral transmission bacteria. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So when your your food has gone stale, you've it's gotten infected, then you've eaten that food, and some of the contents of the food have gotten stale. So if you've eaten it, then you go into a hospital or a healthcare facility, they tell you, you have something called food poisoning. So uh, when you have food poisoning, they, they give you medications to uh, try and stop the diarrhea that actually people have. I usually advise patients to take lots of fluids and water because of replacement of whatever you're losing through, through diarrhea. Uh, you're given medications to actually stop the diarrhea. You're given medications to try and replenish your uh, bioflora in the, in, the, in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is food poisoning does not necessarily have uh, yet association with organophosphate poisoning mm -hmm. unless it's malicious intent that mm -hmm. maybe some, some have occurred in scenarios in, around the world where people have been poisoned at their, at their food using mm -hmm. this organophosphate poisoning. Mm -hmm. But in, uh, most of the times you won't find them being poisoned, uh, having contact with, uh, by mistake with mm -hmm. Organophosphate. So most of these food poisonings that we see around is because of stale food, uh, stale ingredients in food, or taking a contaminated food whereby you start eating. Now maybe uko meosha, mikono. Ama the person preparing the food, aku ame, ame clean themselves very well. Ame osha mikono yao, vizuri. So you're exposed to some of these common uh, bacteria like cholera, typhoid, dysentery, amoebiasis things like that. Mm -hmm. So when you get to a health facility, the healthcare decides to anasema wacha ni pime cho, then aki pime cho, then they come and tell you, oh, you have amoebiasis, which is a form of food poisoning. Mm -hmm. They give you medication for that. It usually passes. It's a very tortures, uh, it tortures you for the people who have actually experienced it. Kwarisha si si raisi. But... Uh, it's actually, it, uh -huh. uh, it can't be controlled. So uh -huh. you're given medications to stop the diarrhea, take lots of fruits, uh, fl uh, fluids, take lots of fluids. Uh, uh -huh. To prevent it, be clean. Uh -huh. Be, be clean. clean. Uh, the, good, the good thing that has come out of the...
Okay, uh, we apologize for that technical hitch, uh, but uh, I think uh, we are back. Uh, Dr. Ari was actually uh, explaining uh, the issue of food poisoning. I think it was uh, finished up on food poisoning. Of course, if you already tuned in, uh, remember that today we are talking about uh, first aid uh, for three emergencies. That is uh, first aid for uh, bleeding, first aid for uh, stroke, and first aid for poisoning. So we've actually handled bleeding, I think, conclusively. We've talked about uh, poisoning. I think we are uh, we are almost also done with it. Uh, Daktari was just uh, differentiating for someone uh, the difference between uh, food poisoning, food poisoning and uh, organophosphate poisoning, which are uh, uh, could occur maybe because of uh, interaction with chemicals by mistake or uh, when somebody is trying to actually commit suicide and they end up uh, try, uh, maybe inhaling or coming into contact uh, with uh, uh, poisonous chemicals. Um, hope the sound is back. I'll tear up Felix. I'll come to Kwanza Kuniambia. So I think I can actually confirm to us if uh, the sound is okay. Uh, of course, somebody is also trying to call in, but then we to Malizara Bada show. Okay, so thank you so much for making time. So, Daktari, uh, you're actually finishing up on food poisoning. I think uh, I do, you were saying something about um, uh, people to continuing to wash their hands. Uh, you know, the epidemic uh, somehow, yeah. so yeah. you were mentioning something about that. Yes, so uh, I was, I was, as I was saying, so the good thing that has come out of an epidemic, if something can actually come, <laughs> good can come out of an epidemic, is we have a very good practice of washing our hands. Now we have access to washing hand uh, places where we can actually wash our hands, even in public places. There are very many. We have sanitizers, bottled uh, sanitizers that are actually easily available, cheap, and af okay, cheap might not be the right word, affordable. <laughs> Uh, in such situations. Mm -hmm. So it is very good practice, more so for food poisoning, to actually uh, wash our hands and uh, clean our hands. So sanitize your hands, wash your hands before you actually ingest any, any food. If you're taking a fruit, wash your fruit first. Wash it with running water, then you actually ingest the, the fruit. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was talking about is for people working in, uh, in farming uh, areas that are exposure to chemicals, mm -hmm. be it insecticides or pesticides, uh, in farming equipment, it's, I believe it's very good practice to actually wash when you're out of that situation. Mm -hmm. So if you've dealt with the uh, chemicals, you say you are trying to spray your farm, mm -hmm. after you're dealing with it, mm -hmm. remove your clothes, wash your hands before you can actually interact with other individuals. So you don't want that scenario whereby you've gotten home, mm -hmm. you've dealt with chemicals the whole day, mm -hmm. you've not uh, removed your clothes, you've not washed your hands, mm -hmm. then your kid runs and jumps on you. Mm -hmm. Then they start inhaling such substances from your from your clothes. Mm -hmm. That becomes a very sad situation. So wash your hands, wash yourself. Uh, I believe most uh, times when you are dealing with these chemicals, you have protective gadgets on us. When you're done with them, remove them. There is usually uh, good procedures. Some people dip them in soapy water. Some people dip them in jig to try and wash them before they can use them the next the next day. Mm -hmm. And for you, when you have uh, removed all your your gadgets and your equipments and your clothes, you can actually take a, a shower. Then clean yourself up before you, you go home. Mm -hmm. By doing such simple uh, protective measures, we go, it goes a long way in actually preventing accidents from such kind of poisoning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you so much for that, Dr. Of course, uh, so many people saying thank you for the commercial break. At least you're now back. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Nathaniel Kangogo, comedian, saying good morning. Good morning to you. Chep Koet Zaitun saying good morning. Good morning to you. Chemeli Lili, good morning. Good morning to you. And if you have any question to ask, Dr. about, um, I, we've talked about bleeding, poisoning, and stroke. I see some of the people coming in asking questions about bleeding. Uh, you, the link will remain on uh, the page so you are able to actually go back and uh, look at what we have talked about. So many questions are. Uh, have been answered about uh, bleeding, and I may not want to uh, go back to them. So um, with poisoning also, uh, I believe that uh, we've actually touched uh, on most of it. Of course, if uh, also um, you find that somebody has actually taken chemicals or you uh, believe that uh, maybe somebody was trying to commit suicide has used a certain chemical, Dr. Aria said it will be good for you to carry that bottle with you, put it in a plastic bag and uh, take it along with the patient to the hospital. So with that, I believe uh, we can now continue to talk about stroke, but then before we go there, allow me to continue reminding you that we are coming live from Dawi Freak Photography. Dawi Freak Photography is situated in Eldoret at Zion Mall, 
So um, Zan Mall is actually just along Eldoret, uh, or rather Nairobi, Uganda Road, opposite Barangetun. So anytime you need uh, those family portraits, I'm sure Dr. Ari can confirm to you that these are very family, <laughs> family friendly space. So anytime, <laughs> anytime yeah, yeah, you would want to bring yeah, in your family to take very nice photos, I shall tell people that if you need um, a good experience um, in front of the camera, then talk to us because we are the back of the camera to make sure that you receive some nice experience. So as you can just continue with today's topic, of course, Dr. Shari, let's now go to stroke. And a lot of questions came in when I actually posted about stroke. The first question was, what is stroke? Uh, to simplify it, stroke is uh, a situation whereby your brain or part of your brain, brain cells miss oxygen due to either a clot to a blood vessel or a bleed from a, from a blood vessel. So to break it down, uh, simply you have a situation by each, each part of your brain and all your brain cells are supplied with blood. Blood carries food, nutrients, and oxygen that the brain cells actually need to, to operate optimally. So when you have occlusion of this blood to that a particular point in your brain, you get a stroke because the brain cells there start dying off. When they start dying off, that's when activity, uh, some of the activities that this part of the brain controls also becomes impaired. So in layman's time, a stroke just occurs when you have occlusion to your, to your blood supply to a particular part of your brain. Yes. So, um, okay, so what are the physical signs now that somebody has actually undergone or is uh, having a stroke? Having a stroke, yeah. Oh, so the, the most obvious signs that you'll see is uh, losing functionality mm -hmm. in a particular area of your body. Mm -hmm. So you can have someone having weakness, loss of functionality to the right upper limb, mm -hmm. the left upper limb, mm -hmm. the right leg, the left leg, mm -hmm. you're losing functionality in those areas. <laughs> you have losing functionality on one side of your face, mm -hmm. but you, part, you find someone you have a drooling face mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. You're losing, you find someone having deviation of the mouth to one side. Mm -hmm. You're losing functionality to the point someone can be able not to talk well. There's no, sound does not actually come out. Those are some of the major signs that you actually see in an overt stroke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then maybe what are some of the risk factors that could cause stroke? So stroke uh, has a, quite a number of risk factors. Mm -hmm. uh, top of the line is, uh, we call them non-communicable diseases, the lifestyle diseases that people have. Diabetes and hypertension are really high up the list in uh, actually risking people getting, having high risk of getting strokes in our bodies. You have genetic factors that also play a part in getting stroke, usually very minor, but also do occur in such situation. You have obesity. Obesity and increased uh, BMI has a high risk of getting, getting stroke. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting how this uh, comes together. I think uh, we had, um, we had uh, a nutritionist on the show, they say the same thing. Uh, we're now having a doctor saying the same thing. The other time we had a chef, they say the same thing. So <laughs> I think you need to watch your weight. <laughs> Because everyone who comes to the show says, you need to reduce your weight. <laughs> anyway, just to continue the topic. So um, uh, you've given the obvious signs that maybe somebody uh, could actually uh, be going, undergoing a stroke. And um, uh, I think the same question will come back then. Um, is stroke something that happens gradually or is something that will happen just once? And, uh, because when you talk about first aid, we, we assume that this is something that mm. maybe we're a story and I'm to that kidoki dogo. something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, happen it's, it's not uh, most of the times, 98% uh, of the time, stroke is an acute thing, meaning it happens.
can get so I, I think I think Doc, you'll take it up first from the introducing the stroke thing. Mm-hmm. As I sort your mic, I'll just try to sort my hand. Okay. Yeah, we'll be able to. Yeah. Okay. So and let. Yeah, so take it up from the <laughs> from the point where you introduce the ratio of stroke and uh, just like a screw. So. You this blood to a particular point in your brain, you get a, a stroke. So a stroke will occur when those brain cells start losing functionality and as a consequence, you have loss of functionality in a part of you, of your body. So some of those symptoms that do occur when you have a stroke are losing functionality. Overtly what you will see, someone will uh, lose functionality to the a hand, so be it the right hand, the left hand, the right leg or the left leg, you have loss of functionality to part of your face, whereby you have a drooling face, you, uh, you can have deviation of your mouth, you can have difficulties talking, that can occur, some of those symptoms that can actually occur during a, a stroke. So some of, the, some of the types of stroke we see, uh, you have two major types, you have ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic stroke. And ischemic stroke is whereby uh, you get a clot on a blood vessel that supplies a part of your, your brain. So the clot can either be a blood clot or a, a fat clot. Most of the times it's a, it's a blood clot. Mm-hmm. Then hemorrhagic clot, uh, strokes occur whereby you have a rupture of your, a blood vessel that supplies the, an, a, an area of your brain. your brain. So when that blood vessel ruptures, uh, consequently you miss oxygen to that part of the brain. Then you have bleeding into your, your brain. So when you're having a stroke, uh, what are some of the things that you actually need to do? Uh, not much that you can actually be able to do at that particular point in time. Mm-hmm. So what you need to, if you cannot be able to take yourself to hospital, shout for help so that the person next to you or um, nearby you can come and take you and rush you to a, to a hospital. Mm-hmm. Because most of the times you will not be able to know which kind of stroke it is. And let's hope also that maybe it does not affect the mouth then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, because it may need to clap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's very important. But try as much as possible to, to alert you. someone mm-hmm. to actually help you get to a facility because most of these strokes you won't be able to to handle at a at a, mm-hmm. at a home setting, ama mm-hmm. outside setting. So they need to be rushed to hospital. Mm-hmm. Time is of the essence. When you get them to us in less than twenty four hours, it's very good because if they have in an uh, having an hemorrhagic stroke, and when you get you rush to hospital. Uh, a level five, level six hospital that contains the right equipments to actually uh, investigate. Mm-hmm. When you investigate fast enough, we can mm-hmm. be able to to assist. Mm-hmm. There are surgical interventions that can occur mm-hmm. that we actually uh, help mm-hmm. to be able to tackle things like hemorrhagic stroke. Mm-hmm. So the earlier for these patients, the better, mm-hmm. because you do not want this patient to the exposure or the hurting of these blood cells to to uh, brain cells to mm-hmm. occur for for long enough. Mm-hmm. So as just like poisoning, stroke time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. Time do kusema kwa all emergencies. Time is of kusema. Time do the essence. Because mm-hmm. with this emergency, when you get to us fast enough, we can it gives us time to, to intervene. Mm-hmm. If you come late, may say for a stroke, you're three, four, five days down the line and it's maybe it was a bleed in your brain, some of these uh, disabilities become mm-hmm. permanent. Mm-hmm. So you, when you come to us in, a, in less than 24 hours and maybe it was a bleeding in the brain, surgical intervention can be done. You have neurosurgeons in place, surgical intervention can be done to help this individual. Then they start regaining whatever they, they lost. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, Fanuel George there saying, thank you, Dr. Ari, for explaining what a stroke is and how it comes to be. Uh, somebody there saying also that the sound is now okay. Um, we got Small saying, good morning, Tim Morning Glory Show. Thank you so much uh, for that. Mr. T, the MC, I think uh, you can now confirm to me that we are now okay. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, somebody also saying here in our mock wing, yeah, inbox and some other term, a stroke has been associated with uh, stress before. Uh, does it mean that when you are de- s- depressed, you could get stroke and all that? I uh, think uh, the long one, but then asking about if stroke can be caused by actually uh, mawazo. Ma- yeah. 
It's usually uh, uh, a misconception that occurs most of the time that ukifikiria sana utapata stroke. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is because of the risk factor of hypertension being a, a risk okay. factor of stroke, mm -hmm. uh, stress usually uh, leads to increased blood pressure in your, mm -hmm. in your body. Mm -hmm. One of the responses of stress. So when you have uh, a lot of stress and your pressure has increased in your body, you can easily get a, a stroke. A stroke. Mm -hmm. But does not mean directly it causes mm -hmm. stroke. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to push uh, people so much, most of people with depression. Mm -hmm. There's a way we can help them. Mm -hmm. uh, because depression is also a very serious issue, a very serious uh, psych psychological issue mm -hmm. that can actually be helped. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to tell them, una Nakula stress utapata stock. No, not not really. Fakara skega was zero kisema. What a group at stress to repair stock. No, 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 not really, not really. Uh, just try and help them. It's, there's a different way of trying to help them. Try, help them get to, get to a health care facility, help them to see psychologists, help them to see psychiatrists, even any other trained medical uh, practitioner that can actually help them deal with the, with the stress <laughs> and the depression. <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need to scare them off with a, with a with stroke. A stroke. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to scare them because that direct link is not necessarily there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, uh, as also, uh, just to remind you that we're also coming to the tail part of this particular broadcast. If you have any questions to ask Dr. Tari, uh, this is a time to do it also. Um, I love the those confirming to me that the sound is back. Um, I uh, think uh, we are now okay, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we're coming live from Dawi Africa Photography. Uh, today with us is Dr. Tari. His name is um, Nathaniel Mwadime. He comes from Topid Hospital. And uh, as I promised, is that for the next few weeks, we'll be interacting with uh, um, medical experts from... Um, Topil Hospital to just help us uh, with uh, uh, health education on different conditions that uh, affect us day in day out. Today we've been discussing and uh, we continue to discuss um, bleeding, uh, first aid uh, interventions for bleeding. Uh, we've talked about uh, poisoning and also now uh, trying to tackle a uh, stroke. And I think uh, we've said much about it. Uh, my next question, of course, Dr. Ari, this will always come back, is uh, about the issue of some of the mistakes that we do, because of course, we, with uh, most of uh, Wanainchi, the issue is uh, what I need to do and what I need not to do. So uh, what are some of these mistakes that people do when somebody uh, is uh, going through a stroke or undergoing a stroke? Okay, uh, some of the simple mistakes, the, though with the stroke, not very many mistakes can be made because there's not so much that you can actually control during that during partic that particular episode. But some of the mistakes you can do, one is uh, delay. Delay is one of the many mistakes that can you can actually do. Mm -hmm. If you're next to someone who is experiencing a stroke mm -hmm. or has just experienced a stroke, mm -hmm. uh, as I said earlier, time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. So rush them to a health facility as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Some of these patients can actually have, most of for patients who have had a hemorrhagic stroke, they can pass out. They lose consciousness and they and they pass out. So it's very important when someone loses consciousness and passing out, do not feed in any way because of the risk of, of aspiration. Rush them to a, to a health facility. If someone is actually vomiting during that particular moment in time, what you can actually do is try and position them in such a way that the vomiting can actually get out of their mouth. Don't position them that the neck is actually up, that some of that vomiting can go to the, to the lungs. Just like the way you deal with someone who has taken alcohol and they are and they are vomiting, you try to lie them on the, on the side so that they, the vomitors can come out. So someone can be experiencing a stroke and then they start vomiting. Mm -hmm. So what you can do, try and position them rightly, let them lie laterally on the side so that the vomitors can actually, can actually come out. Mm -hmm. As you prepare to rush them to a, to a health facility. Mm -hmm. So some of the mistakes and misnomers that can occur is when someone is having a stroke, some people can decide to go to Kienyeji. Before, okay. you go to, uh, before you go to a health facility. Uh, just like I said, it's not very easy to identify which kind of stroke someone is having mm -hmm. by just looking at them. Because there are two types of stroke. There is ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. So by just me looking at you, Kalia, and you're having a stroke right now, I'll not tell you, are you having a hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke? Mm -hmm. But when you get to a, a health facility with the right equipment to actually investigate, CT scans to actually investigate the brain, we can actually tell which kind of stroke you are. You, are you, are, you, are you, you have undergone, mm -hmm. and we can actually institute measures to actually help you. So instead of when someone is, has gotten a stroke, uh, mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. 20 hospital, time in a end. Time in a end. 
I cannot really advocate for Kenyeji because you don't know the mechanism of action of how it actually works. It actually works. So when you rush someone to hospital, sometimes surgical intervention is the first thing that we need to, to do. So when you're giving them medication and maybe they require surgery, see where the conundrum occurs. Mambo yendani. Yes. <laughs> so what happens is rush them to a, to a health facility. Don't take to Kenyeji first. No. Take them to a hospital. Let's, a CT scan is very quick. Less than five minutes we know what this patient has. Mm -hmm. If it requires surgical intervention, we reinstitute re surgical intervention. So b basically, if you come to hospital within 12 hours, you will have been uh, mm -hmm. corrected and intervened immediately. And when you do that, we buy us time so mm -hmm. that now power can start coming back. That functionality that was actually lost acutely can start coming back. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the long run, this patient will appreciate because you acted promptly. They were able to be helped. Now they can be able to walk out of hospital again. And maybe when they are coming in, they were not, they are not, not walking. Okay. You see, now timely intervention has become a very important issue. So do not rush to other services. Uh, let's say you're rushing to Kienyeji, or you're trying to delay care at home, maybe because of lack of money. We have level six facilities, mm -hmm. public facilities, emergencies can be, can be helped. So rush them to hospital, let the investigation be done. Doctors are there. A timely intervention will be done. This patient might walk out of hospital, and they'll really thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll be going back to Daksari for his uh, parting shot. Of course, if you have any other questions, then uh, you may also uh, continue asking us. Uh, there's somebody saying, remembering uh, the many days my mom used to tell me, where Utani pair stroke. Anyway, <laughs> then there's somebody else uh, saying what here. Um, uh, there was a question, I think this is about poisoning, but then um, I don't know why it's jumping uh, before Daktari leaves. You know, Daktari at a talk up and after Mwanze kuniuliza maswell na misi juu kitu. Somebody saying is blood infection poisoning. Okay. Um, I think Daktari will tackle that as part of his closing uh, remarks unless uh, also there's something else you may need to tell. Uh, you have any other question, but I think uh, I've exhausted all the questions that came in. So uh, Daktari also as, as part of your closing remarks, is there, there's any other thing that uh, you may want to also pass uh, may, that I may not have been asked about the three uh, emergencies and their first aid also you'll be able to uh, say. Okay. Yes, so uh, as we get to our closing remarks, my, my urge to everyone, is in emergency situations, we have to take care of time. Time helps us to be able to intervene. Time helps us to be able to reverse some of the situations that are actually going. If it's an accident situation, someone is bleeding, you've helped them by stopping the bleed at that particular point in time. If you can rush them to the nearby facility, that is very helpful for them. Even in uh, corrective surgeries like uh, reattachment of a limb, the time becomes important because you don't want the other, the other limb to start dying off. So also time has become an important factor. If, uh, in poisons and uh, ingestion of poisons, when you've helped this patient to be able to decontaminate them the best you can at the, at the site that you are, rushing them to hospital in time helps. Because for poisons, uh, I've noticed that this, uh, most of these poisons, their action keeps on getting worse as time goes by. There's something called aging in, in, a, in a attachment and neurotransmitters when we go back to the uh, to their physiology and biochemistry of how it actually occurs. So as it continue goes, goes time continues goes. There's there's irreversible situations that actually do occur. Mm -hmm. So when you waste uh, this time with these patients, uh, le 24 hours is usually very what we call prompt acting. Mm -hmm. Medicine gives us 24 hours to actually act promptly. Mm -hmm. So for things like poisoning, for things like bleeding, for things like uh, strokes, when we come in time, we can be able to help in time and the patient and the victim can be able to walk out of hospital as good as they, they will have hoped to come into hospital. So uh, my, my plea to everyone outside there, when you find yourself in an emergent situation, be it bleeding, strokes, poisons, or any other kind of emergency, rush them to hospital. Mm -hmm. Rushing them to hospital really helps this, these individuals to actually help us to be able to intervene in, in time. I, one of your videos has actually asked about blood and blood and infection, infection and whether poison. it's poisoning. Um, nah, not necessarily. Most of these infections are because of uh, be it bacteria or viruses or fungi. So these organisms are there in our in our environment. So when you get infected with them, it does not necessarily come from a 
from the classical poisons that you're talking about, mm -hmm. like chemicals in nature. So for food poisoning, can be caused because of some of these infections. You have uh, bacterial infection with cholera, typhoid, amoebiasis, amoeba infection. Chemical is where we, we talk most of about poisoning. So poisoning mostly comes from chemicals. Some these chemicals don't have bacteria in them. What they do is they alter the, the biochemistry in your, in your body. Mm -hmm. So when they do that, you have effects due to altered physiology and biochemistry in your body. So blood infection does not really necessarily correlate with, with poisoning. But these poisons can also affect your blood because they are transported from one part of your body to the next through blood. They can seep through your skin and get into your bloodstream, get to another point of your body. You can inhale them, they get to your bloodstream and get to another point of your body. So blood infection and poisoning, not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I think uh, you can now give uh, an or you end your closing remark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a man of very, 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 very okay, many so words. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for mm -hmm. making time to be with us. Of course, uh, uh, we've been with uh, Dr. Mwadime uh, from Topil Hospital. So uh, Dr. Mwadime uh, has actually taken us through uh, emergence, uh, through maybe common injuries and uh, their um, uh, first aid um, interventions. We've talked about bleeding, we've talked about poisoning, we've talked about stroke. Um, if you missed any part of the broadcast, that of course uh, the link will remain on our page. You can go back there and actually look at everything that we talked about. Also, uh, this video can uh, be will also be readily available for anyone who needs to uh, rewatch it. Even if you need it on a flash disk, you can also always get it. Uh, Topil Hospital is uh, situated uh, in Eldoret at a place called Elgon View, just next to our hotel called uh, Boma Inn. Anytime you have anyone who needs a quick medical intervention, uh, remember to just refer them to Topil Hospital. Recently, they had a camp uh, for a spina uh, bifida, if I'm saying that uh, rightly, and also hydrocephalus. And I think I'll give a chance to Dr. Ari to also say something about what they do in terms of brain and spine. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, welcome all to Topil Hospital. We are next to Boma Inn at Elgon View. We are a brain and spine center. But we also deal with all other kind of medical services we do provide. We have a pediatric cardiologist, we have general surgeons, we have orthopedic surgeons, we have cardiothoracic surgeons in place, we have a psychiatrist in place for our mental issues, which has become a very important factor in our society this today. You have medical officers, you have top-notch nurses, and we have equipments uh, that are of the highest standards, you can be able to help our, our patients. So. With Topil Hospital, like my colleague uh, Kali I just talked about, we had a recent camp for uh, spina bifida and hydrocephalus to help our children who are born in such uh, conditions. It was a very successful camp. Thank you for the marketing that went out there. We were able to help uh, children to be able to do corrective surgeries to actually give them a better a better life. So it was a very successful event. We welcome each and every individual if you have any spine problem, any brain problem. If you have any medical condition of, of any kind, welcome to Hot Topil Hospital. We are ready to help you. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for that. And of course also, um, we'll be taking a break next week, Wednesday. I uh, will not be here maybe from Monday to Friday, but then when we, back, when we come back in the new year, I believe a doctor or somebody else from Topil will be able to also take us through uh, some of the other uh, common injuries and um, and uh, their first aid interventions. Of course, we're just trying to look at the common ones because if we say we'll go through all of them, we may not be able to exhaust them. We're just trying to look at our society at the moment and trying to look at some of those important things that we need to know. So, of course, I believe that if you are to be involved in an incident that is bleeding or there is poisoning or a stroke, then you are in a better position to act in terms of helping the patient. The biggest lesson today, uh, having been that uh, time is of essence. So make sure that uh, you actually act uh, promptly enough to make sure that uh, you uh, help the patient, but also be able to uh, get them a uh, professional, rather get them to a hospital uh, quite uh, faster. Uh, with that, uh, see you tomorrow. I think tomorrow uh, being the family and uh, relationship uh, day, we'll be talking about succession planning as a region also, and as a country, we still have issues with uh, succession. Somebody saying, maybe Mimi is taki kuandika will, because I believe if I do that, I'll die and all that. But then we'll have an expert to tell us whether that is actually true or not. Uh, so tomorrow, we'll be talking about succession uh, planning. With that, we've been coming live from Dawia 
your freak photography, make sure that uh, you visit us for those nice portraits. Um, we have very good offers right, uh, right now for all mounts and frames. So make sure that uh, you pass by and check uh, what we have uh, for you. With that, see you tomorrow. My name is MC Kalia. Make sure that in this world where you can be anything, be kind. See you.